partitions, but having no doors. The washrooms were divided into two sections. In the front section was a long tin trough, spaced with spigots of hot and cold water, where we washed our faces and brushed our teeth. To the rear were eight showers, also separated by partitions, but lacking doors or curtains. No privacy, right? The showers were difficult to adjust, and we either got scalded by torrents of hot water or shocked by an icy blast of cold. Most of the Issei were unaccustomed to showers, having known the luxury of soaking in deep pine-scented tubs during their years in Japan, and found the showers virtually impossible to use. Our card-playing neighbor scoured the camp for a container that might serve as a tub, and eventually found a large wooden barrel. She rolled it to the showers, filled it with warm water, and then climbed in for a pleasant and leisurely soak. The greatest compliment she could offer anyone was the use of her private tub. The lack of privacy in the latrines and showers was an embarrassing hardship, especially for the older women, and many would take newspapers to hold over their faces or squares of cloth to tack up for their own private curtain. The army, obviously ill-equipped to build living quarters for women and children, had made no attempt to introduce even the most common of life's civilities into these camps for us. Let's pause for a moment and write this down. To think about cultural challenges, the Japanese culture that prides itself so much on independence, and here we are, stuck in camps where we have to rely on other people. The Japanese culture that relies so much on privacy has to go into latrines without doors, into showers without doors. The challenge here, writing down at level one, what is the major challenge here? To somehow keep some sense of hopeful optimism in the middle of these trying situations, always asking, what did we do to deserve this? How can this be fair? This can't be right. And yet, having to endure. Let's, let's list one more that's obviously really important. Notice, the perspective is from the perspective of a child, right? When she's there as a child. We don't really get the perspective of the adults, the mother, the father. We can often imagine, though, how challenging it was for those parents to try to provide a positive situation for the younger children, right? Notice here, a child sleeping so hard that he cannot be awakened by the knocking on the, on the door. A, a, compelling, a compelling story in itself. All right, let's keep going. What are some of the other challenges involved? During the first few weeks of camp life, everything was erratic and in short supply. Hot water appeared only sporadically and the minute it was available, everyone ran for the showers or the laundry. We had to be clever and quick just to keep clean, and my sister and I often walked a mile to the other end of the camp where hot water was in better supply in order to boost our morale with a hot shower. 592. Even toilet paper was at a premium, for new rolls would disappear as soon as they were placed in the latrines. The shock of the evacuation, compounded by the short supply of every necessity, brought out the baser instincts of the internees. And there was little inclination for anyone to feel responsible for anyone else. In the early days, at least, it was everyone for himself or herself. One morning, I saw some women emptying bedpans into the troughs where we washed our faces. The sight was enough to turn my stomach and my mother quickly made several large signs in Japanese cautioning people against such unsanitary practices. We posted them in conspicuous spots in the washroom and hoped for the best. Across from the latrines was a double barrack, one containing laundry tubs and the other equipped with clotheslines and ironing boards. Because there were so many families with young children, the laundry tubs were in constant use. The hot water was often gone by 9 a.m., and many women got up at 3 and 4 in the morning to do their wash. Wow. Huh? All of which, including sheets, had to be done entirely by hand. We found it difficult to get to the laundry by 9 a.m., 
and by then every tub was taken, and there were long lines of people with bags of dirty laundry waiting behind each one. When we finally got to a tub, there was no more hot water. Then we would leave my mother to hold the tub while my sister and I rushed to the washroom where there was a better supply and carried back bucketfuls of hot water as everyone else learned to do. 593. By the time we had finally hung our laundry on lines outside our stall, we were too exhausted to do much else for the rest of the day. For four days after our arrival, we continued to go to the main mess hall for all our meals. My sister and I usually missed breakfast because we were assigned to the early shift, and we simply couldn't get there by 7 a.m. Dinner was at 4.45 p.m., which was a terrible hour, but not a major problem, as we were always hungry. Meals were uniformly bad and skimpy, with an abundance of starches, such as beans and bread. I wrote to my non-Japanese friends in Berkeley, shamelessly asking them to send us food, and they obliged with large cartons of cookies, nuts, dried fruit, and jams. We looked forward, with much anticipation, to the opening of a half dozen smaller mess halls located throughout the camp. But when ours finally opened, we discovered that the preparation of smaller quantities had absolutely no effect on the quality of the food. We went eagerly to our new mess hall, only to be confronted at our first meal with chili con carne, corn, and butterless bread. To assuage our disappointment, a friend and I went to the main mess hall, which was still in operation, to see if it had anything better. Much to our amazement and delight, we found small lettuce salads, the first fresh vegetables we had seen in many days. We ate ravenously and exercised enormous self-control not to go back for second and third helpings. The food improved gradually, and by the time we left Tanfarin five months later, we had fried chicken and ice cream for Sunday dinner. By July, tubs of soapy water were installed at the mess hall exits so we could wash our plates and utensils on the way out. Being slow eaters, however, we usually found the dishwater tepid and dirty by the time we reached the tubs, and we often rewashed our dishes in the washroom. Most internees got into the habit of rushing for everything. They ran to the mess halls to be first in line. They dashed inside for the best tables, and then rushed through their meals to get to the wash tubs before the suds ran out. The three of us, however, seemed to be at the end of every line that formed, and somehow never managed to be first for anything. 594. One of the first things we all did at Tanferin was to make our living quarters as comfortable as possible. A pile of scrap lumber in one corner of camp melted away like snow on a hot day as residents salvaged whatever they could to make shelves and crude pieces of furniture to supplement the army cots. They also made ingenious containers for carrying their dishes to the mess halls, with handles and lids that grew more and more elaborate in a sort of unspoken competition. Because of my father's absence, our friends helped us in camp, just as they had in Berkeley, and we relied on them to put up shelves and build a crude table and two benches for us. We put our new camp furniture in the front half of our stall, which was our living room, and put our three cots in the dark, windowless rear section, which we promptly dubbed the dungeon. We ordered some print fabric by mail and sewed curtains by hand to hang at our windows and to cover our shelves. Each new addition to our stall made it seem a little more like home. One afternoon, about a week after we had arrived at Tanferin, a messenger from the administration building appeared with a telegram for us. It was from my father, telling us he had been released on parole from Montana and would be able to join us soon in camp. Papa was coming home. The wonderful news had come like an unexpected gift, but even as we hugged each other in joy, we didn't quite dare believe it until we actually saw him. Notice, uh, just to end now at, at uh, level one, notice back uh, one page on, on uh, 592, the baser instincts happen in these kinds of situations. 
Everyone competes. Everyone for himself, herself. People are not always so quick to help and that kind of thing. The sense of community is somehow disrupted, right, in this experience. Finally, write it down at level one, the food. Hungry all the time, and the food is really, really bad. To be taken out of your normal rhythms and then not be allowed to have any kind of cuisine that feels right for you, obviously makes, and to be hungry all the time makes it a really difficult experience. Finally, notice this cutting. Again, there's a, this is a longer book, right? This cutting tells us that the father finally released um, from his experience in Montana and is going to finally be able to allow to rejoin the family itself. Let's jump to 2A really quickly. What for you are the major messages or themes here? Some will comment on the strength of character to keep going in the face of tremendous pain and suffering. Some will write about the fact that life is sometimes not fair. And for those of us that have said, I want life to be fair, a, a cutting like this reminds us, life is not always fair. And tragic things happen to people who don't deserve those things at all. Finally, strength of character is the only way to endure. And community is a huge part of that. The way that we get through terrible times is often in our sense of community and home. Neighbors. At 2B, let's write down now, what is the author's purpose here? It seems that there's probably two. One is to inform. Let me tell you what the experience was like. I have sophomores who will admit, I never ever heard about this at all in American history. And now all of a sudden I'm like, what? This happened in America? Are you serious with me? And again, it's one of those things where we have to come to terms with certain parts of our nation's history of which we're not that proud. Obviously, author's purpose, number two, is to talk about the challenges and the ways in which they got through. The celebration of family and the celebration of the courage of family. At 3A, what is for you the texts that you're most familiar with that talk about the experience of the war, the representation maybe of the Japanese Americans during the war? What are the films for you, the TV shows for you, the video games that maybe you know about that play with that same notion? Or what's the text for you that talks about needing courage to be able to get through a tough situation? Or what's the titles for you that remind you of the value of family and community and friends to be able to get through tough circumstances? Finally, at 3B, how do you relate to a text like this? Some of my sophomores have said in the past that sometimes it reminds this reading, reminds them of their first moments at summer camp, the very first time they went, or the first time they were displaced for some reason, and they had to come to a new place, new environment, and find new rhythms, and how difficult that was. Another 3B question, if you were in a situation like this, would it be hard for you to get through? How would you get through? If your family was immediately uprooted, do you have a family, a community around you that you're a part of that would be able to get through something like this if you were dislocated? What kind of courage have you shown in your life that's similar to the kind of courage that was required here? Well, it is a tragic moment in American history, and yet we have to, we have to appreciate a text like this that educates us. Thank you.